For day two of Stoic Week 2014, what I wanted to do is share with you some, some interesting discussions and some points from one of my, my favorite thinkers of all time, Marcus Tullius Cicero. Now, Cicero himself is not actually a Stoic per se in the sense of being totally committed to that school as, say, Cato was. Uh, or as you know, Seneca and Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius after him are going to be. But he is somebody who is very receptive to a lot of Stoic doctrines. He sees a lot of useful and good ideas in, in their philosophy. He's blending Stoicism together uh, and sometimes placing it in dialogue, in actual dialogue, where you have a Stoic and Epicurean, a Skeptic and Aristotelian, all these people talking to each other. He's placing it in conversation with some of these other schools. And in doing so, he is, in cer certain respects, um, very similar to some of the other middle Stoic figures who were saying, yeah, I think that we need to borrow some, some elements from here and some from there, and, and maybe Zeno and Chrysippus were actually wrong about these parts. But that's a whole you know, other story for, for another time. So in, in any case, with Cicero, what we've got is a Roman who is not only you know, very, very interested in philosophy, very interested in, in culture in general, but also um, it, you know, involved in practical and political affairs. He is seeing the very end of the Roman Republic. He's seeing the great upheavals that are taking place in the struggle between uh, Sulla and, and Marius and, and their followers, you know, spurred by the Gracchi, and he's also, you know, front and center in what's ultimately going to be a, a power play between Pompey and, and Caesar and all the things that are leading up to that. So he's there in the middle of the, you know, at that time, one of the most dominant empires in the ancient world where a lot of things are happening. And so he's able to reflect on all sorts of issues that are, that are really germane to Stoicism across the board, you know, focusing not only on, on say, what it's like to, to have a wife who gets him in trouble, who she actually does uh, in part of this story, uh, to lose a daughter when his, his, his beloved daughter dies, um, you know, to, to lose friendships, to deal with uh, his own feelings of ambition and love for fame that he has to conquer at one point. There's this very personal thing, and then you know this this panoramic picture of Greek and Roman culture. And he's really a major contributor to this this movement of taking Greek culture which at that time is not just in Greece, it's also in all these Greek colonies around the Eastern Mediterranean, and importing it to, to Rome, and trying to do something than just, you know, picking up a bunch of statues or pots and, and you know, books from the library and bringing them in there. He, he aims to translate, in, in the real sense, not just word by word, but he aims to translate Greek thought and culture into... Roman life, Roman words, Roman mentality. And that's what he's doing uh, with this, this wonderful little work, The Stoic Paradoxes. So let's, let's turn to that and uh, talk a little bit about the work itself. So in the preface, he's addressing this, this Stoic Paradoxes to this guy Brutus, whose uncle is Cato, and Cato is a Stoic, very important um, politician and leader, uh, both military and, and political. Uh, and Cato represents Stoicism sort of taken to its, its Roman extreme. So Cicero says, I've noticed that your uncle Cato, in making a speech in the Senate, deals with arguments drawn from philosophy which do not conform to our usual practice. And, and but that his oratory succeeds in making these acceptable even to the general public. Now, that's kind of an interesting idea. The Stoics were saying things that are paradoxical, paradoxa, going against um, prevailing opinion. They would say things like, 
whether it's a little thing or a big thing, if it's wrong, it's wrong and it's all equally wrong. That's one of the ones that we'll, we'll look at in, in a bit. And most people, when hearing that sort of thing, they think, that can't possibly be right. That doesn't make sense. That's what a paradox is. And so Cato is able to say these sorts of things and not only use them in a political setting, not a philosophical setting, not an academic setting where, you know, or a salon or something like that, but when people are getting down to brass tacks and saying, look, do we execute this guy or not? Um, how are we going to deal with this conspiracy? How do we apportion out these offices? What are we going to do with this mess? Cato is actually doing Stoic philosophy, uh, and, and he's doing so in a very strict way. He's not cutting any corners. So he says, this is a greater achievement for him than it would be for either you or me, because we make more use of the system of philosophy, which is the parent of oratorical fluency. That's, you know, another philosophical system. And the Stoics had their own sort of attitude towards how you ought to engage in public speaking. Oratory means public speaking, persuasion. So the Stoics, their view on this, as, as Cicero is going to tell us, is that there are certain topics that you can use rhetoric for, that you can use the techniques of persuasion for. So, you know, what would those be? Um, he talks about uh, um, employing the embellishments of eloquence when discoursing on grandeur of mind, greatness of mind, mag, you know, magnanimity, um, or self-control, or death, or the glory of virtue in general, or the gods or love of country. And so there were certain things that were felt to be, these are appropriate occasions to talk big, to, to pull out all the rhetorical stops. And Cato would do that. Whereas other people, you know, they, they might do it a bit more broadly. And Cicero says, that's, that's actually what I'm going to do. Um, I've amused myself by throwing into common form for your benefit even those doctrines which the Stoics scarcely succeed in proving in the retirement of the schools of philosophy. So instead of, you know, doing it big, you might say, oratorically or rhetorically, just in terms of the things that you can get some people to say, yeah, virtue, I'm, I'm for that, or uh, love of country, Cicero is saying, I'm going to take the things that are really hard to, to, to buy into, the, the, the difficult sayings, you might say, of, of Stoicism, and I'm going to try to make the best argument I can for them. These are little, little exercises for me, he says. Um, he says, um, I wanted to bring out into the light of daily life um, these paradoxes, and expound them in a form to win acceptance. So, I wrote with greater pleasure, he says, this is really interesting, because the doctrines that are styled paradoxa, that means, you know, going against the prevailing view, are, in the highest degree, Socratic, and far and away the truest. So, so Cicero is saying, I'm not really a Stoic myself, but it seems to me that this is the stuff that not only is it the hardest to get other people to accept, but this is probably the stuff where the Stoics are actually correct. And what they're doing here is sort of replicating what was right in Socrates. Socrates, as we know from Plato and, and Xenophon, his, his students. So he says, um, you'll therefore receive this brief little essay, and this is very short, the, the lamplight production of the nights that are now growing shorter, um, and you will sample a class of exercises that I have made a practice of employing when transposing things expressed in the schools of philosophy in the form of logical demonstration, so taking textbook philosophy, you might say, and the academic you know, presentation of it, and putting them into this oratorical style of discourse that is my own. So I'm, I'm taking this and I'm putting it into my own, not only my own words, but my own style. I'm a guy, Cicero is saying, I'm a guy who likes to make cases. That's why I'm a lawyer. That's why I'm, you know, a politician. That's why I, I do the things that I do. I'm going to take these things that seem to be totally 
abstract, totally a matter for the schools. Nobody could possibly believe them, and I'm going to try to make a case for them. And that's what he's doing here. The first of six paradoxes that Cicero is going to discuss here in the Stoic Paradoxes is this, that only the morally noble, the honestum, is actually good. And this is kind of a you know, wrench in the machine in a couple different ways. If you approach ordinary people and you say, what are good things? They'll give you a list of things that they consider good, and usually these will map on to each other fairly well. I mean, if you come across somebody who says, well, you know, what I think is really good is when you get people and you take them down into your dungeon and torture them. Okay, that person's pretty far out of the norm, but a lot of people will say things like money, or being successful, or having some work that you enjoy doing, or my family, or, you know, having enough to eat, or, or things like that. And Cicero is... is throwing, you know, something in there and saying, you know, even if those things are good in some sense, they're not really good unless they're honestum, unless they're truly good, unless they're at this, this higher level. And, you know, he's also, by, by saying this sort of thing, taking a strong stand against certain philosophies. Some, you know, some philosophers like the, the hedonists, would say, look, pleasure or absence of pain, that's really the only good. And Cicero thinks, that's, that's off, that's misguided. The Stoics are actually correct about that. Um, but Aristotle would say, okay, pleasure, it's not the good, but it certainly is a good. It's a good thing. It's just not the honestum in, in um, the noble, the kalon, the higher form of good. But it is a good. Aristotle is pretty, pretty clear about that. So here's a place where the Stoics are taking a strong stand, not only against, say, the Epicureans, but against the, the other people who say, gotcha, I'm with you on this, that the, you know, whatever you're going to call honorable or noble, this highest good, well, we can agree that that's really what's most good. But the Stoics are saying this other stuff below it, they're neither good nor bad. As a matter of fact, sometimes... They're, they're actually harmful to us. So, how is he making this case? I've got, you know, some points up here, and there's really four main things going on. I've got them a little bit out of order if you're following along with the text, because the discussion about pleasure actually comes after this, and the examples of great people are kind of interspersed throughout. But let's look at what he says. So, he starts out asking, well, what's not good? but appears to us so. What do people think, mistakenly, is good? And he gives some really interesting examples because some of these are quite contemporary. Houses, you know. Um, you're not going to see Plato and Aristotle talking an awful lot about home decoration, but Cicero actually does. And if you think about our own culture and how people invest so much time and attention and effort and emotion into making their, their house or even their office or even their car the, the place that they want it to be and how frustrating that can be and how you know easy it is to, to go off the, the rails when it comes to these sorts of things. Oh, you knocked over my vase. Get out of here. Uh, that, that sort of thing. Those are external goods. Um, there's all sorts of other external goods that we could think about too. Money, you know, property. Um, Clothing that, that we have, that's another uh, good example of an external good. And he, you know, he says, there's some problems with this. Some of these are actually not good for us, they can harm us. You know, you might have a great liquor collection, but if you're getting drunk every night, it's not really good for you, is it? Um, even though you can use it for ends like, you know, promoting conviviality among your guests. But if you're passed out in the corner because you had too much of your, you know, whatever it is that you like to drink, that's not really a good thing. Um, if decorating your house turns you into a obnoxious jerk who wants to show off to everybody, or turns you into a hyper, you know, anxious person, make sure not to, to step off of the, uh, remember those, those uh, plastic runners that people have in their houses? Uh, I remember some friends who had those. We always thought that was kind of weird. 
Um, but, you know, people get obsessive about that. That's not really helping them. It's not a good for them. And then he says something that I think is even more interesting that other philosophers will, will pick up on. And this must be coming from not so much reasoning about these, these matters, but um, from, from engaging in, in sort of common experience. There's things that people consider to be good, like money, for example, or, or possessions, or think about collectors. And when they get what they want, even when they possess it, it doesn't satisfy them. If somebody's life revolves around money and money making as the prime good, they can never get enough of it. And Cicero says it's really strange when you think about it. You want to say that I'm paradoxical, you know, bringing this up? Think about this paradox. That guy's got everything that he actually wants, and he's still not happy. Because apparently, even having it, and he's got it. Check his bank account. It's not enough for him. So he says, what kind of a good can it actually be that when you have it, it doesn't satisfy you? So those are some real problems. And then he, you know, he brings up some examples of um, famous people, and he says, um, think about our ancestors in Rome. They were persons of self-restraint. They didn't call all these things goods. They formed an entirely different view of them in how they should be, you know, estimated, how they should be balanced against, these, uh, against each other. He says, um, you know, think about furniture or cattle or things like that. Those aren't really that valuable to us. He actually lauds this guy, Bias, who's a, a Greek, who is leaving, you know, there's a catastrophe that happens, a natural disaster, and he's got to get the hell out of there, and everyone's grabbing their stuff and going. I might be tempted to take some of my books along. B.S. just takes himself, and people are like, hey, you left your stuff behind. He says, I've got my stuff. It's right here. This is, this is my stuff. Everything else is not really my stuff. And he, um, he asks uh, Cicero, he says, did um, the men who, f who founded this republic and who bequeathed it to us, did our ancestors, the people that must have had something on the ball, because look at what they were able to do, did they think about money primarily? Or did they worry about having beautiful grounds for their delight or furniture for their gratification or banquets for their pleasure? He is probably idealizing a little bit, but if you think about this, the people who actually did something, something that's lasting. Were they motivated just by enjoying these, these sort of external goods? And he says, think about, you know, each one of these. Place them before your eyes. And this is, you know, pretty typical oratory. He's trying to add up a whole bunch of examples. But I've, I love this, this, uh, this question that he's got here. What was the ladder by which Romulus, the founder of Rome, climbed to heaven? Did he rise by means of goods, what your school calls goods? or is by, by achievements and his virtues. People become great, not because they manage to throw really cool parties because they've got a lot of money socked in the bank or they go into, deep into debt. People become great because they actually leave something behind that has to do with what's morally noble. They, they contribute. There's something lasting about that. So we want to look at examples of this. What about pleasure? Physical pleasure has a different sort of claim upon us. You can say, yeah, you know, I don't want all this stuff because I just want the stuff. That's stupid. I want it because of the pleasure that it gives me, and I don't even need that much of it. I mean, take myself, for example. I, I like drinking wine. I'm not a wine connoisseur, so I can be pretty happy with a, a 5 to $10 bottle of wine, uh, and, you know, somebody who's a connoisseur might need a, a 50 to $100 bottle of wine. So I'm a much cheaper you know, enjoyer of, of the pleasures of the palate and also the pleasures of intoxication than that person. But can pleasure really be the good? Can pleasure be what is most good, what we ought to be paying attention to? Cicero has a different answer here. He doesn't say, look, it's something that you can strip away from us or, you know, it might be harmful. Some of the things that give us pleasure might be harmful to us. Um, and he doesn't say, well, you know, you can have as much pleasure as you want, but it's not going to satisfy. He doesn't pursue that line, although perhaps he could. He says, what are you, just an animal? 
And here, you know, there's, there's an appeal to something that's very often engaged in in ancient and medieval philosophy. He says, um, you know, are you just like a cow or, a, or a, you know, a pig or something like that? Is that all that's going on with you? He says, um, on you has been bestowed by God or else by nature. I don't even have to worry about where it came from. The gift of intellect. You have something in you that is precious, that it elevates you above the other animals. I don't even need to say that you're radically distinct from the other animals. Maybe if you gave a pig intellect, then we'd have to you know, see it as an equal. That's all fine. Point is, you've got it. And why would you want to live a life that doesn't actually employ that intellect, that just descends to the level of, he says, four-footed beasts? It's the most excellent and divine thing that exists. You have a choice in this. And he says, here's another thing that you want to think about with pleasure. Is there any good thing, really good thing, that doesn't actually make its possessor good? Pleasure doesn't. Good people and bad people can enjoy pleasure, but that's not what makes them good or bad. We might say, well, what about the connoisseur who can enjoy, you know, a whole range of pleasures that the other person can't? Maybe there's an argument there. But the basic idea is pleasure itself isn't the primary good. It's not even really a good for the Stoics. So what is? Well, this is the question. Well, what is good? And he's got two answers to this that really amount to the same thing. He says, what comes to be rightly, honorably, and with virtue. Um, he, in this translation here, it actually says that it's uh, actions. He says, um, an action rightly done and honorably and virtuously. But that's not what the, the Latin text actually says. It just uses the word fit, which means something that is done, something that comes to be. So... You know, conditions that I'm in, or the kind of relationship that I'm in. That could be something that comes to be rightly. Recta means straight. Honorably is that honestum, that highest, you know, kind of good. Honest is, is, is a word that we get from that. So you might say honestly or honorably. And with virtue. And then a little bit, you know, just after that, he'll say... Um, I deem only what is right and honorable and virtuous to be good. So it's not just actions, it's people, it's states of affairs, but they have to be right, they have to involve virtue, and they have to be honest or honorable, they have to, to fit some sort of moral code, you could say. And that code, he doesn't think, is you know something artificial, um, you know, that we have difficulty discerning, a lot of the time it's pretty easy for us to know what the right thing to do is. We often have a conflict between the honestum, the good, the, the calon, the, the noble, and pleasure that we'd like to enjoy, or external goods that we'd like to hold on to. But the, here he's making the strongest case possible for only the morally noble, only the honestum is actually good. In paradox number two, Cicero, again, takes a stance that many people are going to have a, a lot of trouble with. He says, not only is virtue its own reward, but possessing virtue is enough for happiness. As a matter of fact, possessing virtue is the only thing which will truly make us happy in, in this discussion here. Now, why is that? You know, he gives some examples of virtuous people who suffer but who are also happy. And we take those as sort of our, our guideposts. So who is he actually talking about here? He says, um, Marius Regulus, who is a prisoner in, in one of the wars and who was sent back to Rome to arrange peace between the Romans and the Carthaginians. He actually advised against it and then went back to Carthage where they tortured and killed him. Now, most of us would look at somebody like that and say, well, first off, that guy's nuts because he should have stayed in Rome. But if he, if he you know, went along with that, he must have been unhappy, at least when they were torturing him. 
Cicero says no, he was actually happy because he was doing what he ought to do. He was living a virtuous life. He says the tortures of the Carthaginians could not affect his greatness of mind or his dignity or loyalty or constancy or any of his virtues. Nor even his mind itself because that was, that was guarded by the virtues, although his body wasn't. Um, and so, you know, what's going on here? This goes against our normal way of looking at things. Um, for the Stoics, supreme happiness lies in being totally self-sufficient. Now, that doesn't mean self-sufficient in the sense of, like, you know, you'd have a whole bunch of cans of food stored away, like, you know, preppers, and, you know, so whatever comes along, you've got your bunker to take care of. That's not the sort of thing that we're talking about here. What we mean is rather something like that, but on a spiritual, a mental, a virtues and habits plane, where everything that is going to affect you fundamentally depends on you. Everything that's going to affect what's most important to you, where your hopes, where your dreams, where your loves, your hates rest, uh, as Epictetus would say, your aversion and desire, that's placed within your own purview. And what allows you to do that is, is, is having virtue. So he says, um, supreme happiness lies in total self-sufficiency, having uh, all your possessions within yourself alone. But by contrast to that, the person who puts everything out there into the world is putting things into the world's hands and the world is going to screw with you. The world is going to damage your stuff. Um, I mean, you know just as well when you lend things to people, and then we're here, we're talking about people. We're not talking about inanimate, you know, processes that, you know, are, are blind and dumb. When you lend things to people, they return it and it's all messed up. What do you think the world is going to do if you're going to place your hopes and desires out there? So he says that's the kind of person the person who's doing that, that you can actually scare with things like death or exile or the loss of possessions. You can make them feel fear. You can even make them feel fear about things that they're not even likely to, to encounter. You can pervade their existence with that. And that's being miserable. So he says, these other goods, if we think that other things that we suppose to be goods or other people tell us are goods or our culture tells us are goods, are really good, besides virtue, we're setting ourselves up. We're making ourselves vulnerable to all these things that, that can coerce us. When somebody does something wrong, when they abandon what they know to be right and good, why do they do it? In many cases, it's because they're, they're afraid, because they're suffering. And that's because they're aligning themselves, they're aligning their values with things that, that really don't deserve it. By contrast, virtue depends on us. If I'm virtuous, if I'm a courageous person, only I can take that courage away from me by choosing to act in a cowardly way, by choosing to give in, by choosing not to persevere when I should. That's up to me. I can blame it on a whole bunch of other things. I can say, yeah, but they were, they were threatening me. They were going to take my life. The Stoic would say, you don't control your life. You control whether you have virtue. You control what you do with your choice. Virtue depends on us. Nothing else can take it away, according to Cicero and according to the Stoics. Only our choice to trade it away for something that's not really worth virtue. And sometimes what we're doing is we're not trading away a virtue that we fully possess, we're trading away our beginnings of virtue. Although that's, you know, sort of a contested point among Stoics as well. Um, if we really understand what virtue is about, if we really see the goodness in it, we won't trade it away for other things. We won't say, you know, I know this is the right thing to do, but I'd like political office. I know this is the right thing to do, but I'd really like to get that promotion because that's going to have a bigger salary and then I can get the better house and I can finally pay off my car and blah, 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 right? Virtue 
has to be seen as the primary good and as enough for happiness. Cicero goes on further and he says, look, if, if part of what it is to be a good person, part of what it is to enjoy happiness, is that you're going to do good things, virtue is what you do good things through. So if you act courageously, if you act temperately, if you act wisely, if you act justly, it'll be because you have that within you and you make it operative and it produces good actions as a result that then you can actually feel, feel good about. You can say, aha, that is mine. You can't take away the fact that I actually did a good thing. You can take away my life, you can take away my clothes, you can throw me into the garbage dump, you can tar my, my you know, good name and uh, say horrible things about me, but you can't actually take away the fact that I did a good thing. In Stoic Paradox number three, although it's framed in terms of wrongdoings being equal and right actions being equal, I have to say that there's an awful lot more stress placed on the wrong actions being equal. And probably because we, we do need more reminders about that. I think we, we have um, less need to be reminded that right acts would, would be equal. That's an interesting topic in its own right. Cicero spends a lot more of his, his time and ink on demonstrating that even in little things, if we're screwing up, we're screwing up. And screwing up in a little way is in many respects just as bad as screwing up in a big way. Now that sounds paradoxical. That sounds kind of strange. And why is that? Cicero says, well, there's different ways of looking at doing the wrong thing or also doing the right thing. A lot of people will focus on the consequences. Did the consequences result in overall good or overall bad? If they, if they resulted in bad, did they result in the least of possible evils? And Cicero says that's not really what we want to be focused on. They do matter. Consequences are consequences. He also says another thing that we tend to focus on are what he calls occasions or the, the situations in which we find ourselves. What really matters though, what matters most, is the action that we engage in, the kind of action that it is. Not, you know, when it happens or with what effects, but the kind of action that it is and the mindset, the motive, the intention that we have in doing it, what that reveals about us and our character. Cicero says that where, you know, the stuff that really matters happens is over here. Obviously, you can do the same action and have very different consequences. You can do the same action in different situations. But if it's the same action, it's equally bad or equally good no matter how you're doing it. So, you know, he gives an example um, of, of, you know, committing infidelity in, in, in sexual relations. And so, you know, some guy can't keep it, you know, in, in his proverbial pants, although at that, that time I suppose it would be, you know, under his tunic. Um, and he ends up sleeping with, with a few, you know, people that he shouldn't sleep with, a few other people's wives. And that's eh, not that big of a deal. It's not like he slept with, you know, uh, a whole bunch of people's wives, or it's not as if he slept with famous people's wives where it like cause a scandal in society. He's just, you know, getting, getting a little on the side. Cicero would say, no, that's equally bad. And we could say the same thing, he doesn't use this as an example, about um, telling lies about people. Well, I'm just going to tell a little lie just, you know, for the sake of having a funny story to, to tell at the bar about somebody who, who nobody else knows. Is that the same thing as, you know, going to court and um, telling a, a lie about an important official, say that they take bribes? In a certain respect, it's just as bad, according to the Stoics. There's a, another way in which it might not be as bad, but we'll, we'll see that when we get down here to talking about, you know, multiple actions. So, you know, it's not the consequences, it's not the occasion that make an action bad. He says... Um, you know, you say it's a small matter, but it's a great offense. You know, whether a helmsman capsizes a ship with a cargo of bullion, gold, 
or a barge laden with chaff, you know, what we call uh, just bran or stuff like that, makes little difference in the makes some little difference in the result, the the outcome, but it's no it's it's not different in respect of the helmsman's incompetence. And so the idea here is that it's whether we're doing well with our own resources, our own choices, our own, you know, disposition over what it is that we actually own, our desires, our reactions, our thoughts, our emotions. That's where this stuff comes in. And so he also says, you know, look, if, if, you're, if the question is, did you transgress? Did you break the rule? Did you go against your duty? You either did it or you didn't. There isn't any big or little. There is yes or no. There is do or don't. And that might take a little bit more explaining, but he doesn't provide any more there. He also says, and this is another interesting argument, if the virtues are actually united with each other, if the virtues are equal to each other, then so are the vices. So, you know, you, you don't get to say, um, well, that guy over there, he's a terrible person because he's got the vice of greed. I just lose my temper every once in a while because I've got a bad temper. I'm irascible. Cicero would say, look, you're equally bad. That guy over there who stole a million bucks, you're just as bad as he is. You're just not stealing a million bucks. You're not in that, that you know, thing. You're not in that, that situation. Nobody gave you a million bucks to embezzle. But if you do bad stuff on a little level, you do, you're going to do it on a big level, too. Um, he goes on and he says that actions that seem more wrong, like, you know, somebody says, so you're saying that if I kill my father, that's not worse than killing some random stranger that, that I just happened to meet? And he says, well, no, it isn't, as, it isn't any worse just insofar as it's killing but you're doing a couple different things. You're killing a human being in both cases. But with the father case, you're also adding some other stuff in. You're transgressing against the, you know, a duty that you have of gratitude. You can add a whole bunch of other things in. This is why lying at the bar about um, you know, how far you can, you can throw a ball or something like that is not as bad in some respects as lying in open court about whether somebody takes bribes because you're doing more than one thing in lying in open court about whether somebody takes bribes. You're, in both cases, you're lying, but you're also perjuring yourself and you're also subverting the court process and you're also, you can add all sorts of other things in. So this is how Cicero gets around these, these sorts of uh, questions. But the paradox is that even in little things, we gotta, we got to stop screwing up if we want to get any better. He says, um, in the conduct of life, we should not consider what penalty belongs to each transgression, but how much is permitted to each person. We ought to deem whatever is wrong a crime, whatever is not permitted a sin. Even in the smallest things, he has an interlocutor say, yes, even in the smallest things, inasmuch as we're not able to impose regulation, order, upon our own affairs, we're screwing up. And we need to fix that. Stoic paradox number four is a little bit funny because in this one, Cicero is actually calling somebody out. Not by name, but by giving so many details that it could only be this guy, Clodius, who was, you know, one of the, the politicians and he, he did a lot of crazy stuff in, in Rome, uh, really over-the-top kind of things. He ends up becoming a political enemy of Cicero after being an ally at a certain point uh, because of the shifting politics that are taking place in ancient Rome. And here's what number four is, is actually about. Every foolish person is crazy. This is a Stoic doctrine. And Cicero is saying, look, it just happens to fit this guy to a T, so I'm going to address it to him. Uh, but we could actually expand this and, and think about this in terms of anybody who is um, taking stances that we would say are, are, you know, essentially out of touch with reality, counterproductive. Uh, and he's saying that a, a person who is foolish is not just foolish. They're not even just wicked. They're not even just an evil person. Clodius is, is pretty bad. But... 
they're actually crazy. And the words that he uses are dementum, literally out of, out of your mind, and he uses the verb insanere, to be crazy, to do crazy things. And now, the question we want to know is, why are they crazy? Why is this person being said to be crazy? Why would we see other foolish people as being crazy if we're Stoics? And the answer is, because they think things to be radically different than they actually are. So Clodius, in this case, is somebody who's managed to um, gain power in Rome, at least to a limited extent. He's uh, brought, you know, indictments against Cicero. He raises all sorts of trouble. He gets some of the citizens also stirred up against, against Cicero. He also does a lot of other stuff as well. And now why does he do this? Because he has a screwed up understanding of, of things, not only about the Roman Republic and not only about Cicero, but even about himself and about what the good is and about how somebody ought to behave or how they ought not to behave, who his friends are, who his enemies are. And Cicero focuses in particular about his views on uh, political life. He says, um, you know, what is a state... Every collection of uncivilized savages, every multitude even of runaways and robbers gathered into one place? Not so. Our community was not a state when laws had no force in it, when the courts of justice were abased, when ancestral custom had been overthrown, when the offices of government had been exiled, the name of the Senate was unknown in the Commonwealth. During this, this time, and he also mentions Catiline as well, another bad guy in Rome, there really wasn't a Roman Republic left. There is a name of it, but thinking that that's actually the Commonwealth or the Republic, that's a sign of being nuts. So he goes on and he says, you know, you think you exiled, from, you exiled me. First off, I left before you even brought up the charges to try to exile me. Second, there wasn't any state that could exile me because it was just you and all your buddies, and that's not really a state. But you, you know, you can think it is all you like, but you're nuts. You're, you're, you know, you're foolish. Um, so he says, I was a citizen all the time. Are you a citizen? No, you're a criminal. You, you can't be a citizen. You can have the name citizen, but to be a citizen actually means to be a responsible member of this political society, this, this organization of people who are supposed to be working together for some sort of common end. And you're not that, Clodius. So if we get away from Clodius himself in these examples, we can think of all sorts of other instances where somebody is just out of touch with reality, you know? The person who thinks that, hey, I'm just going to heap up a ton of money and then everybody's going to love me because I'm going to spend it here and spend it there. You know, that's, that's a mistaken view on life. The, the idea that um, I, I don't really need to work on my character. I just, I just work on my body. I'll get, you know, uh, some, some work done, as we say, and, you know, go to the gym, you know, three times a week or something like that. But I'm not going to fix what's wrong with my personality. I'll be attractive then. Well, yeah, but you won't actually be attractive to the kind of person who'd be any good for you because you don't even know what the good is. So Cicero would say we could multiply these kind of examples to infinity within his own culture and within our contemporary culture. But the, the bottom line is that every foolish person, they're not only foolish, they're not only bad, but they're actually in some sense nuts. Paradox number five is a really interesting one. This is typical of the Stoics, also of some other uh, moral theories as well, and it has to do with a very sophisticated understanding of the nature of human freedom. So what he says is that only the sage, only the wise man is actually free. Every fool is a slave. And what's going on here? This is a conception of freedom and servitude, or of something else being able to call the shots, being able to determine, that's at odds with the ordinary way in which we think about freedom. So we ask, well, what is freedom? And one common answer to, free, to asking what is freedom is the ability to do what one wants. So he puts it in terms of the power of living 
as one wills, according to one's own choice. And he uses the term living there, meaning, you know, that we're not just talking about one moment, one, one situation, we're talking about something that's longer term. And it's a capacity, it's a potestas, it's a power, it's an ability. So what goes into that? That's where the, the roads really fundamentally diverge. And if you pick one road, that goes, you know, one way, and if you pick another road, it leads to a totally different place. Now, one traditional way of looking at this has been to ask, well, what, what is it to, to really do what it is that we want to do? Does it mean doing whatever the hell you want? Does it mean, you know, indulging yourself as much as you possibly can? That's, that's the way some people have talked about it. Cicero says, living as one really wants to, deep within us, there's something within us, no matter how screwed up, how corrupted we are, that recognizes what is right, that recognizes duties, and that wants to be aligned with that. And you, you see this even in complete scumbags, there's always some part of them that's you know, kind of regretting or longing for that, that, that missing goodness. So Cicero says to live as one wants to is really to follow what's, what's right, to enjoy our duties, not just to do our duties, but to actually rejoice in them. The, the word that he uses here in, in Latin is, is uh, quite interesting. He says, um, here we go. Uh, Quis egitur vivit ut vult nisi, qui recta sequitur, who follows what is right, qui gaudit officio, who, who takes joy, who rejoices in their duties. Because they recognize, it's good for me to do my duties. It's, it's good for everybody that I actually do what I'm supposed to do. Uh, and he goes on, you know, um, who uh, has a well-considered, what we can call, life plan, if we want to put it in our contemporary words. Not just a lifestyle, but a life plan. Uh, you know, some, some ideas about how am I going to actually make it through this, this world, what am I going to give priority to? What am I going to say doesn't matter? Who should I uh, associate myself with and who should I avoid? What kind of job should I get? What should I do in order to get that job and keep that job? That's all part of this, this life plan, this, um, you know, qui vivendi via, considerata aque provisa, you know. That's all important. And he goes on and he adds some other things that I didn't put up here. The, obeying the laws not because of fear, but because one respects the laws and judges that that's the, the right thing to do. And then he goes on and he says, a person like this, everything that they say, every utterance, every action, even every thought that they have is voluntary. It's what they want. It's theirs. How so? Well, all of their affairs, all their race, their, their, you know, their um, actions, their, their relationships, and their intentions, their plans, their concilia, they, as he says, they start and they end in that person. They, they have their beginning in that person because that person is actually calling the shots. Something else isn't calling the shots. And they have their end in that person because that person is not just concerned about getting something external. They're concerned about who they are, about their character. And nothing has more influence on a person like that than their own will, their voluntas, and their judgment. Now, if you only had that part by itself, it would sound pretty egotistical, wouldn't it? They only, you know, the only thing that moves them is their own, their own will, and they're the end, and they're the beginning. But if you align it with this other part, actually following what's right, enjoying one's duties, following the laws because one recognizes that they're good, these two things come together. That's what it means to really be free, according to Cicero. The wicked, the foolish, by contrast, are slaves. Even when they think that they're totally free, they're slaves. Why? Because something else is calling the shots. They do have a free will, and they are following their will. But their will is being tempted, it's being attracted, it's being you know, sort of sucked into the gravitational well of something else that's not really good for them, 
And if they had, you know, their, their head on straight, they wouldn't be desiring. So, you know, he talks, for example, about um, men and, and, you know, chasing women. We could say the same thing. It could be equal opportunity. It could be all across every, every sexual relationship you could possibly think of in terms of desire. If that's really what's running your life, you're in bad shape, Cicero would say. Because something else is calling the shots, not you. Um, people who engage, he doesn't talk about this so much, but people who are engaged in retail therapy, you know, they feel good when they go out and they buy something, so they, they get some credit cards and they run that up. Man, that's to be in bondage. That's to be a slave to somebody else. That's to be a debt slave. And we could go down the line. There's all these things. He talks, a great example in his own time, about the things that people would do for money. One of the things that people would do for money back then was seeking out what were called legacies. So you find some rich old person and you get in good with them, probably by you know sleeping with them or doing dirty deeds for them that you don't really want to do that are demeaning, putting up with their, their, their nonsense, their, their BS. And then you hope that they're going to mention you in their will and give you a big amount of money. Well, you know, is that to be free? That's to be a slave of the worst sort. That's to be a slave. This is a time, you know, when people actually had slaves, right? That's to be worse than the slaves that are there. And so he talks, you know, at great length about instances of, of this sort of thing. And he says, um, think about other examples. The class of desire that does seem more worthy of a free man. The ambition for office and military command and governorships. And this is a harsh mistress, he says. This is something that, you know, you want to move up in the ranks? Boy, you're going to have to do a lot of selling of yourself in order to do that. You're going to have to conform yourself, not to your desires, not to your will, not to your conception of what's right and wrong, but to somebody else's, so that they'll actually give you that promotion. And even if you do it, they may not give you that promotion. And even if you do the right things, the people may not recognize that. If that's what you're going to run your life around, you're laying yourself in for slavery. Now we reach the last of Cicero's Stoic paradoxes, and this one is even more paradoxical on its face than many of the others, but it's also brilliant in the way that he discusses it. He's, he's pulling out all the stops when it comes to argument and rhetoric. And it runs like this, only the wise person is rich. Only the wise person is rich. Now, you know, we, we often say stuff like, oh, they're rich in, in you know, goodwill or stuff like that. And we, we get kind of mealy-mouthed and Pollyannish about this. But Cicero is actually saying, no, we gotta, we got to be serious here and think about what being rich really does involve. Is it money? Is it possessions that make us rich? It's a, it's a live question. A lot of people seem to think so. Maybe they have good reason for having that view on things. Maybe the majority view is actually right. If it's not, we got to show why it's not right. So he says, what is it to be rich? How, do you, how should we understand this? Is this comparative? Do I need to have more than my neighbors in order to be rich? Or do I make reference to myself and say, being rich means owning enough to actually be content. Now, if that's the case, then that's going to depend an awful lot on what it takes for a person to be content. He's got this wonderful expression about people who have you know, full coffers, but are themselves still empty. Because you can pile up as much wealth as you want around yourself. And it doesn't necessarily have to be money. It could be fine things. It could be, you know, beautiful clothing. It could be as many CDs, you know, nowadays MP3s on your iTunes. Have, have a, you know, computer with billion terabyte drive or whatever, however, you know, much would stock all the music in the world. But if you can't appreciate it, if it's not enough for you, you're not rich. You're actually poor. You're actually needy. Even if you've got all this stuff stockpiled, if you don't have your head on straight when it comes to matters like this, you're, you're going to be unhappy. So 
So he asks, well, how much is enough? How much does a person need? He's got some great examples here. He talks about, you know, um, people measure the amount of wealth in accordance with what's sufficient to each individual. If a, does a man have a daughter? He needs some money. You know, and nowadays we don't do dowries. Although, you know, if you're a traditional person and you marry your daughter off, you're stuck, you know, paying for a lot of the wedding because the groom's family doesn't pay for quite so much. You have two, more money. More than two, more money still. We might say these days, you got any kids? Are they going to college? Well, you better figure out where that money's coming from. And he says, um, the measure of a man's wealth corresponds to the amount that he individually requires. Therefore, how is a person who possesses not several daughters, kids are one thing, but desires past counting, which are capable of draining dry the largest resources to receive from me the title of rich, when that person actually feels like they're needy and they say, I need more, I'm not happy with what I've got, I've got to keep making money, I've got to squeeze some more out of this, I need these possessions over here. And you can tell if they need it because they get angry. If they don't get it, they get upset. They become despondent. Or they denigrate the things that they can't get. That's not to be rich, he says. Uh, many people have heard you say that nobody's rich except a person who is able with his own income to maintain an army. Think about how, how hard that would be. We might just say, well, you know, you don't need an army, you don't need private security, you just got to have enough money to have the big house on the hill and have some servants to, you know, a private chef, maybe a tennis instructor, I don't know, whatever it is that rich people are into these days, because I, I don't know a lot of rich people, you can, you can tell. Um, and he says, that's not enough. Those who seek wealth in, in that sort of way, they can never be satisfied. They're always going to engage in some underhanded dealings to make more money. And he gives all sorts of examples here of uh, bribery, dislodging your neighbors, land grabbing, partnerships with, with other people, empty properties, proscriptions of wealthy men. I mean, getting people in trouble so you could confiscate their property. Sort of like, you know, predatory practices that some people engage in today. So the value of wealth consists in abundance, and abundance means a full and oversupplying supply of goods, but this will never be attained by you, because you'll never have enough to feel like it's full. So the question is, what's really valuable? Is it money? Is it possessions? Or is it virtue? If it's virtue, it's got to be real virtue, not the appearance of it, but the virtue that actually makes us self-reliant that makes us able to handle what we're going to encounter, that leaves us content, that allows us to be able to meet our obligations, our duties, to be able to measure up to the situations that we find ourselves in. And he asks, um, what was more valuable? The money that people tried to pay to the virtuous to get them to not be virtuous, or the virtue that they held on to and said, Keep your money. The fact that they held on to the virtue tells us that's more important. That's more satisfying. That's more valuable. You can only have that if you're going to be the stoic wise man. You can only be rich if you actually seek out what's truly valuable. So he, he says, um, this is towards the end, this is a wonderful saying, not to be covetous is in fact money. So not to be greedy, not to desire more, is actually to have money. It's actually to have something that you can trade off and get what you want. Even if you're poor, even if you don't have what we call money, not to be covetous, not to desire more, is actually to be rich. And here's where it gets really interesting. Not to love buying is income. There are people who think, i got to get more, i got to get more, I've got to, you know, uh, buy all sorts of things, I'm going to go to the mall, I'm going to go online, I'm going to get all this stuff, and then I'm going to be happy. And how much money do they spend? How, how high do they run up their credit card bills in doing so? How many loans do they have to take out? They're actually draining themselves. 
you're earning an income just you're actually getting ahead by not going into debt by not buying any more crap by not buying any things that you don't need by not indulging that desire for making the whatever it is inside of oneself feel good by throwing things at it that you purchase you're actually earning an income so he says where is the wicked and the covetous the property that they own is uncertain and depends on chance. They're not actually happy. They're actually needy and poor. It's only the wise person who can actually be rich because the wise person understands what wealth really is.